through all of it, but it essentially does a thorough analysis of the respondent's position, the complainant's position. It took evidence. The evidence were analyzed by Shraj and of significance to me and, and, and hopefully to this committee is the conclusion of Shraj. And Chairman, the conclusion of Shraj can be uh, found at paragraph 12, titled Decision. And this was the decision of Shraj. Quote, the commission is satisfied that the evidence does not support the allegations of corruption and abuse of power against Mrs. Samuel A. Jinapo and Mrs. Asenso Puachi, the two deputy chiefs of staff. The allegations could not be substantiated whatsoever. Accordingly, this complaint is hereby dismissed as being without merit and totally unwarranted. End quote. Thank you. Chairman, just there, you said evidence was taken. Was evidence taken from A plus that you are aware of by Shiraj in this matter? Ye yes, evidence was taken from Mr. A plus. You think that it was just uh, malicious on the basis of the finding of Shiraj that uh, probably just growth? Is that your thinking? Well, Mr. Chairman, I respectfully think that um, on the back of the ruling, the determination of Shiraj, those allegations were totally unwarranted, they were baseless. I have All right. absolutely no doubt about it. Thank you, Chair. It. Chair, the nominee at a very young age became the Deputy Chief of Staff. Having gone through this trauma, and you know in politics, this political enterprise, all we have is our individual image. How did you cope with this trauma of you being tainted, especially when Shraj eventually exonerated you? Within that period, how did you cope? Well, Mr. Chairman, I should say it was difficult. It was very difficult. And especially, I'm sure that many of the members of this committee will um, attest to how it feels when you are maligned when an allegation is made against you which is unfounded. I mean, especially when the whole country and the media picks it up and we all recall how major it was in this country and um, it generated a lot of controversy. So it was difficult, I must, I must admit. And now I personally was particularly relieved and uh, thankful that the matter finally was tabled before Shraj, and Shraj delved into it and, and, and came to these firm um, conclusions. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was a very difficult matter. Chairman, final on my woman. Um, your brother, your blood brother, is a member of the NDC and a member of this house. You are a member of the MPP fraternity. You hold a high position. You're going to hold a very high position now. And no doubt in the previous administration, uh, your deputy chief of staff, very high position. How do you, with the political differences between you and your brother, how do you manage the seeming uh, political conflict, if I should put it. Oh, is there peace at home? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's a question I've had to answer many, many times. Well, first of all, with respect, uh, Honorable Leader, the assumption is that we live in the same home. We don't. I am a married man with four children. He is a married man with three children. So, I know, Jinapo, how long have you been married? I have four children. <laughs> I have four girls. I'm, I know, Jinapo, I'm how long have you been married? <laughs> I did triplets, you know, at the goal. So I, uh, we live very independent lives. And what I can say is just in two folds. First, First is that I can say that for myself and I can say that for him. 
that we are both very, very committed to our respective political parties. I don't intend to go further than that. We are very, very committed. He is, um, he is strongly uh, committed to his party. I'm probably more committed to my party. And we are also very cordial. I mean, we are cordial as any siblings anywhere can be. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. I would want to end with this comment. On the 7th of uh, January, that unfortunate incident on the House floor, I noticed that your, your brother was heated up. You were also heated up. But at the point that two of you uh, got on, and he went to his side, and the turbulence was coming down, and you also gave a word on our side. I hope that with your explanation given, as to the cordial relationship that exists between the two of you, in spite of political differences. In times of trouble, the two of you would help calm waters in this house floor for the benefit of this country. I hope I can have that assurance from you. Mr. Chairman, the leader can have the assurance. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, let me have a bite of the deputy leader's uh, warm up. You are deputy chief of staff. Is that the case? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. What was your schedule and activities or probably responsibilities in the office of the president as deputy chief of staff? Mr. Chairman, as we all do know, the constitution vests executive powers in the president. And the president is a repository of executive powers in our country. He exercises that mandate through the office of the chief of staff. So, Chairman, if you want, the interface between the presidency and the world is normally through the office of the chief of staff. The president is dealing with his ministers, he's dealing with the world, he's dealing with chiefs, parliament, organs of state. The chief of staff's office is the, inter is the interface between the presidency and the world, as well as the discharge of the executive mandate of the president. So I understood my work very clearly from the outset. And those were the instructions the president gave me on that important day when he invited me to his office, to inform me that he was going to appoint me as deputy chief of staff. The instruction was very simple. You are to assist the Chief of Staff. And Mr. Chairman, for the four years that I was in that office, my schedule was to assist the Chief of Staff. And the Chief so of there staff were no specific schedules or responsibility, like you are responsible for port activities related to the port, you are not responsible for foreign delegations. There probably must have been a specific role. Yeah, yeah there were. There was. The, the... Speak to that. Yes, I was, you, Chair. I was Deputy Chief of Staff in charge of operations. And Deputy Chief of Staff in charge of operations, essentially, and I will continue to use the word assist, because the back starts with the Chief of Staff. The Deputy Chief of Staff in charge of operations, essentially, is to assist the Chief of Staff to, first of all, run the presidency of Jubilee House, the workings of Jubilee House. And, Mr. Chairman, I know the Honorable Minority Leader is even more experienced in the issues of the governance of our country than I am. The presidency itself is a whole enterprise. Um, how the office runs, the issues involved there, uh, cabinet issues, policy matters, monitoring, evaluation, following up. The president was, for instance, to set up committees of ministers. You are involved in it. And, and the general, if you want, running of the country, the president runs the country, the chief of staff assists him to run the country. I assist the chief of staff to assist the president to run the country. So, Chairman, I get it from the nominee that he only assisted the chief of staff and the president. May I now take you to the world of lands and forestry? And with respect, Chairman, may I refer the nominee with your indulgence to Article 268, 1 and 2 of the 1992 Constitution and to solicit 
what his views are on those provisions and how he intends to walk the law on those matters. Article 2681 provides any transaction, contract, or undertaking involving the grant of a right or concession by or on behalf of any person, including the government of Ghana, to any other person or body of persons, howsoever described, for the exploitation of any mineral, water, or other natural resource of Ghana made or entered into after the coming into force of this constitution shall be subject to ratification by parliament. So watch my words there. Subject to ratification by parliament. Then 2682 provides parliament may by resolution supported by the votes of not less than two thirds of all the members of parliament exempt from the provisions of clause one of this article in a particular class of transaction, contract, or undertaking. Once you are a lawyer, it means that you studied interpretation. What is your understanding of this constitutional provision, and what obligation does it impose on you as probable minister for lands and forestry? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I like to make the point that a careful examination of Chapter 21 of the National Constitution will clearly reveal the importance the framers of the Constitution places on the lands and natural resources of our country. Mr. Chairman, if I may, the lands and natural resources of our country is the only sector which is found expressions in almost all the national constitutions of our country from 1969 to 1979. There was a full chapter in the 1969 constitution dedicated to lands and natural resources. So was there a chapter in the 1979 constitution dedicated to the lands and natural resources of our country. Mr. Chairman, so the reason, my thinking, is that the framers of our constitution seems to have placed such importance on the lands and natural resources of our country is because by all intents and purposes, the lands and natural resources of Ghana constitute the property of the Ghanaian people, vested in their president to be held in trust for the benefit of the Ghanaian people. And therefore, Mr. Chairman, Article 268, in, in my view, then ensures that given that the lands and natural resources constitute the property of this country, Parliament becomes the accountable body for the utilization and management of the lands and natural resources of our country, which is why the grant of a mineral right will require parliamentary ratification. And, Mr. Chairman, respectfully, my conceptual interpretation of it is that the natural resources belong to the Ghanaian people, it's their property, it's vested in their president to. Um, to deal with or deal in for their benefit. Parliament, pursuant to Article 268, then becomes the accountable body or state for the utilization of the mineral resource of our country. So if the president, through his Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, grants a mineral right, the framers of the Constitution requires that such a grant be brought before Parliament. So Parliament can, can cross the T's, can, can uh, hold the I's, and will be satisfied that as representatives of the people, their property in the mineral resources of our country are being dealt with properly. Mr. Chairman, if I may add, if I may conclude by adding that the Supreme Court got the golden opportunity to speak to or make a pronouncement on this requirement of ratification. And this was done, Mr. Chairman, in the case of Republic. Republic versus High Court, General Jurisdiction, Sex Accra, S Party Attorney General, Eston, Eston, Eston Quebec Group Limited, Interested Party. Mr. Chairman, and in that case, the gravamen of the issue before the court was whether or not a grant of a mineral right without parliamentary ratification will, will, be, will, be, will, be, will be deemed valid. 
the Supreme Court, the the highly respected judge, uh, Justice Mafusa, said this, and I, I just will seek your permission to read the exact holding of the Supreme Court. And I quote, they said, the intention of subjecting any transaction involving the exploitation of any, involving the exploitation of any mineral to parliamentary ratification was to ensure that such transaction had received the approval of the actual owners of the mineral, the people of Ghana. Such approval expressed through their representatives in parliament as engineered by the constitution, end quote. So, Mr. Chairman, I think the, the matter is clear. I mean, you, we, we, All right. you, you have to... In, yes, in that have same to... clause, you will find for the exploitation of any mineral, comma, water, or other natural resource. So water is put in the class of minerals and natural resource. Today, there's a driller at a, a new social center I'm constructing at the quay, drilling water. Now, between September and now, I've drilled boreholes, mechanized boreholes, about 50 of them in my constituency, are they invalid? Because I did not get, <laughs> not just parliamentary <laughs> approval, I didn't get any concession from anybody. We just put the uh, rig at the location and we drill. Is water in this clause? What is the uh, drilling of water? Should it be construed the same way as we construe uh, minerals and uh, other natural resources? Mr. Chairman, um, first of all, water is under the Water Resources Commission, which is not an agency under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. I, I should also respectfully submit that the remit of natural resources as construed in Ghana and under our constitution is a matter that I'm not sure I will have the final say. So there's a lot of discussion about it. Petroleum resources, for instance, are, are those natural resources. Uh, water resources are, they, are these natural resources. But for my purposes, the instructions from the president, and hopefully, if I'm fortunate to receive the recommendation of this house, of the recommendation of this committee and the approval of the house. Uh, I, I will keep to the quote that has been cut from, even that is such a big, a big load to carry. So, so we'll leave it at that. Except to add, Mr. Chairman, uh, finally, that the provision referred to by the Honorable Minority Leader being Article 2682, I think that provision can be a, a bit of a saving grace. And I want to raise the matter of small-scale mining and whether or not there is a requirement for parliamentary ratification when mineral rights are granted under small-scale mining. Technically, and by, the, and by the confines of the constitutional provision, that yes, there should be. But is it practical? Does that help the industry? I think those are matters that we can discuss. Thank you. Chairman, I, but what Chairman raised, probably you can just say that when you get there, because you yourself, in your answer, you are emphatic. Chapter 21, Lands and Natural Resources. So don't run away under Water Resources Commission. What Chama referred to, Article 268, is within what you referred to in your chapter, but still there. May I now, Chama, take the nominee to Article 257, 257. And it reads in one, all public lands in Ghana shall be vested in the president on behalf of and in trust for the people of Ghana. I know you, you are a royal, so you know what land politics means for the people in northern Ghana and every part of the country. But for my purposes, 2573 is what I want to seek your view on. For the avoidance of doubt, it is hereby declared that all lands in the northern, upper east, and upper west region, now, Mr. Speaker, by extension, I can add Savannah region, 
of Ghana, which immediately before the coming into force of this constitution were vested in the government of Ghana, are not public lands within the meaning of clause 1 and 2 of this article. What is your understanding of this? Mr. Chairman, my understanding of this provision is that the public lands of Ghana have been defined by the Constitution. Public lands of Ghana is defined, first of all, in Article 2572 of the National Constitution. The vesting of the public lands of Ghana in the President um, for the people of Ghana has also been well established in Article 2571. My understanding is very straightforward, Mr. Chairman. The framers of the Constitution intended that lands in northern, upper east, and upper west regions of Ghana, which immediately before the coming into force of this Constitution were vested in the government of Ghana, are not public lands within the meaning of clauses one and two and so I, I would think really I mean this this can be um, somebody can take this up at the Supreme Court but from where I sit I would think that uh, lands which were vested before the coming into force of the Constitution are automatically divested Mr. Chairman I should add I should add that there is a whole arrangement and discussion and debate about vested lands. And in fact, Mr. Chairman, uh, this House, Parliament itself, having enacted Land Act 2020, Act 1036, makes a comment on vested lands. Makes a comment on vested lands. And Mr. Chairman, respectfully, and with your indulgence, Section 271, 2, and 3. Of, of Act 1036 speaks specifically about vested lands. And this is what it says, with your permission I read. Quote, 2701, the President shall, on the recommendations of the Lands Commission, authorize the divesting of any land which prior to the coming into force of the Constitution was vested in the President by any law. Two, within six months of the coming into force of this Act, the Lands Commission shall begin the process of evaluating all existing vested lands with a view to recommending to the President the divesting of those lands. And three, finally, the divesting of land shall be by executive instrument published in the, in the Hazette. End quote. Mr. So what it means is that vested lands, whether they will be divested or not, will be determined within the confines of section 270, 1, 2, and 3. It, it will be my view that the lands which were vested prior to the promulgation of the 1992 constitution are exempted. But the question as to whether or not lands which were vested post-1992 will still be captured, uh, we, we, can, we can continue to have that discussion. I, I'm, I'm not too sure about how, how, how we can handle those. Chairman, it's noted, you've just referred to the Lands Act, which was passed by Parliament Act 1063. Now, investors complain about the process, uh, tortuous, cumbersome process of getting title to land, investors. Ghanaian businesses complain, and you know what title means. Even sometimes when you want to get a credit facility of a loan, you need to demonstrate ownership via title. Now, it has affected Ghana's rating in our ease of doing business. Just process of land and related matters of litigation, investors come in, the next day they have to be walking to court instead of the farms or the industry they purport to build. How will you use the new current lands law to improve Ghana's ease of doing business should you become minister. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I think this is a very important question. And since my nomination, I've been reflecting on literally all the issues under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. And if I'm fortunate to receive the recommendation of this committee and the approval of Parliament and I assume office at the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. Chairman, I want to submit that the implementation, the effective implementation of this new Lands Act, Act 1036, will go a great way of improving the administration of land in our country. Mr. Chairman, it's still a piece of legislation, yes. We will require to make sure that we publicize it. We have to get a country to be aware of it, to know about the implications of the provisions of this Act. We must have a, a strategy and a policy to ensure that this Act is well implemented. Mr. Chairman, I say this because I've taken some look at Act 1036, and I should respectfully commend Parliament for enacting this law. My view, my view, Mr. Chairman, is that literally all the thorny, difficult issues relating to land administration seems to have been, uh, this act seems to have intervened in almost all of them. And if you take a look at the act, it's far-reaching, it's detailed, it, for instance, in part one. Oh, it, Chairman, I appreciate it. Far-reaching, detailed. Will you reduce the number of days that it takes any Ghanaian or investor to acquire title to land should you be approved as minister? Mr. Chairman, I will endeavor to do that. And I endeavor to do that through threefold. One, the implementation of this um, Act 1036, because a, 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 an effective enforcement of this Act itself, I mean, as you know, Mr. Chairman, the issues of stool, skin, clan, family, uh, people who have interest in land, the requirement for them to demarcate their land, register it at the Lands Commission to avoid a double a sale, the issues relating to uh, whether a couple can sell land by himself or by herself, all of those issues are tackled in there. So the effective implementation of this act will help. Digitizing the operations of the Land Administration, Lands Commission is key, and decentralizing the operations and services of the Lands Commission. I think this three-pronged approach, one, the implementation of this act, two, the uh, nominee, are you the one, are you the one to decentralize Lands Commission or the chapter, the chapter you refer to deals with it because you already have regional Lands Commission, that is you so. have uh, national Lands Commission, which are all creations of the constitution. But just to end here, Chairman, so that our colleagues can scrutinize our, uh, the nominee, in your response to an earlier question by the deputy leader, you referred to the Exxon cubic ruling, and for your, you quoted Mao Sao, respected justice of the Supreme Court, when he said that parliamentary ratification is an imperative. Should you get to the ministry, and it's brought to your attention that there are over 35 mining companies operating in Ghana without parliamentary ratification, what will you do? Mr. Chairman, I, I think the matters to do with Eastern, Eastern Quebec are beyond me. The Supreme Court has made a firm pronouncement on, on, on those, so that for me is a fair complaint. Um, the matters of other mining rights or leases which have not been um, ratified, we, we have to find an expeditious way of, of making sure that they are, they, they are presented to Parliament. Will, will your expeditious way be that you declare them illegal or you come to Parliament to ratify it. What will you do? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman the, the, the ruling respectfully in the Eston, Eston Quebec was not entirely on the lack of ratification. The, 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 the basis for the holdings of the Supreme Court were not anchored on simply not ratifying. There were other reasons why... The what, what were the other reasons in your view, Chair? I think I, I have the brief here, and um, I, I, I can. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'll be more than happy 
to finish the committee with, 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 a, with a judgment of the Supreme the Court. Supreme Court but, judgment. but essentially, the point I'm making is that. It's all right, Honorable Member. The Supreme Court judgment, we can assess it if we consider it necessary. Yes. Yeah. Mm. All right. Yes, Reverend. I'm grateful, Honorable Chair. Congratulations, Honorable Minister Designate. Oh, upon your approval, not only will you go in history as the youngest member of President Kufado's second term cabinet, but also will be the youngest minister to occupy the mandate of, as the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources. With the enormity of work in that sector in view and the complexity of challenges in view, how does that impose a sense of responsibility? on you to deliver your mandate creditably, knowing that the creditable discharge of your mandate will be an inspiration to many youth who aspire to take a role in governance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, yes, I'm relatively young, but I'm also mindful of the fact that I had a rare opportunity of working with the president for many years when he was in opposition and as one of his chief aides at Jubilee House when he was president. And my view is having worked with the president for four years, I believe that in all humility and modesty, I must have acquired, I must have acquired some experience and uh, the tools to be able to give out my best. But Mr. Chairman, to conclude, my attitude to these matters, whether old or young, has to do with your attitudes, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and those attitudes of uh, being humble enough to, to learn and to listen and to consult and to cooperate and to collaborate. And on that note, I want to put it on record at this committee that if I get the opportunity, I intend to knock on the doors of Parliament and I intend to work closely with Parliament because the issues involved in lands and natural resources, you cannot be successful unless you work with Parliament. There are a lot of um, experts and, and people with capacity in this House which I intend to tap into and to work hard and to try to live above board in integrity. But Mr. Chairman, a lot of examples have been made across the world about age and the race. But I have a homegrown example, which is that I take inspiration from the Honorable Minority Leader, whom in 2009 was made Minister for Communication at the age of 38. He was, he was, he was a year older than me. And, and, and that is an inspiration. So I believe if I, if I marshal the correct attitudes, and, and I'm not too sure that the Honorable Minority Leader did badly at all as Minister for Communication. Do you want to bring him into, and you know, he may react to this matter. Oh. <laughs> so just stay on safe waters. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, he did, I, I, think, I think he held his own as Minister for Communication at the age of 38. And, and I believe that if um, I stay humble and I stay focused, I should be able to contribute my bit. Thank you. Well, thank you, Honorable Nominee. On exploitation of minerals in Ghana, Ghana is endowed with many minerals, of, of which studies have established them in very viable um, quantities. Over the years, the focus of the country has seemed to be um, biased on gold production or exploitation of gold to the under-exploitation of other economically viable metals, and in particular industrial minerals, i.e., salt, limestone, clinker, and the rest. What direction would you provide, when given the nod, to focus other attention on these minerals, industrial minerals in particular, um, salt, limestone, clinker, uh, to, uh, to, with all the economic viability and the economic potentials they possess to exploit them? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think, by the grace of God, if I get a nod of this committee, I will have the benefit of expert advice, and I will also work with all the stakeholders in the industry and the ministry 
to be able to formulate policies for all of these areas. I, I don't want to pretend that I have all the answers uh, um, here. And, and so whatever collaborative efforts is, will be needed will be done. But the member is very right. Salt is a very major mineral, it's a very important resource that we have to tap into. Uh, they call it the white gold. And Ghana is very strategic because we have enough commercial and deposits of salt, which I believe we have to exploit. And the full value chain of salt has to be established here in Ghana. Mr. Chairman, for instance, you cannot build an integrated aluminum industry without salt. You cannot build the integrated iron and steel industry in Ghana without salt. The petrochemical industry cannot um, actually thrive without salt. So salt is extremely important. And so uh, the measures that are to be put in place to develop salt fully, I know that the, uh, the administration of President Akufuado in his first term has made some attempts. Adar Songo is one example where I know a mining lease has been granted as an attempt to exploit the salt there. But I think that it's gotten to a time where we probably should consider the establishment of a salt development authority in Ghana whose mandate will be responsible for building the full value chain of salt in Ghana. Today, Mr. Chairman, Nigeria consumes a lot of salt, and yet Nigeria imports its salt from far away uh, uh, Brazil, simply because we don't have a salt terminal in Ghana. The distance between Ghana and, and Nigeria is closer, and yet they still have to go far away to import salt. I believe if we get this authority in place where we can have a refinery for salt, we can have a terminal for salt, it will, it, will, it will help a great deal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lastly, on lands, um, does this concern on agitations for compulsorily acquired lands to be released? Um, Honorable nominee, when given the nod, what leadership will you provide to address uh, compulsorily acquired lands to be released? He just answered that question. He just spoke to that question. If you want to have another question, otherwise I'll move on. Yes, in Lante, wonderful. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. Um, let me first commend the brother of my roommate for this appointment. My first question to you is something very worrying. Recently, President Anado initiated the fight against Kalamse with a hope of saving the dissipation of our forests and water bodies. Evidence shows that some of the people who sabotaged the effort of the president were people within your party. What assurances are you going to give us that as much as possible, you will ensure that these people do not Honorable, take advantage are you, are you of political... Are you anybody specifically? Is Otherwise, it? you assume that he knows somebody who sabotaged somebody. Oh, if not... Oh, I said some person. of the people, some of the people, it's clear. It's that this one is public knowledge. In fact, source. Don't ignore Min their size. Former Minister for Environment. Honorable, ignore their size and talk to me. Yes. What, are you, what assurance are you going to give Ghanaians that you will not condone such of political apparatchiks using political influences to get into such situation where they will sabotage efforts of a sitting president in mitigating some of these things that affect our environment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we all will acknowledge that in every government and in every dispensation, when you are rolling out policy or implementing policies, especially when you are dealing with very intricate, complicated areas such as illegal small scale mining, you will have problems. There's absolutely no two ways about that. I have taken time to understudy a lot of the literature, and it is clear that when Honorable Inus Afusaini was Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, he encountered a lot of problems. And he will admit it. When 
my uncle Elijah Collins Dauda was Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, he encountered a lot of problems. When Honorable Peter Amewu went into the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry, similar problems. Honorable Asimachire, it's not an exception. So I want to agree with you, Honorable Member, that in, in such crusades, in such fights, you will come across challenges. You will come across stumbling blocks. We all know it. It happened on the NBC. It's happened on the MPP. You have party people. You have big wigs who want to frustrate the situation. But what is important, and what I can say without a shred of equivocation, is that the President of the Republic, Nana Adedan Kwakufuadu, is absolutely committed to making an impact in this illegal small-scale mining industry. He, 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 his policies were rolled out in the first term, and indeed, there were some achievements, there were some challenges. If I get the opportunity, my instructions from the President are very clear that I should go there and keep my, my head focused and work hard to ensure that we reduce the incidences of small, illegal small-scale mining in our country. Mr. Chairman, look, anywhere you have extractive industry, we, here we call it Garamsey. In South Africa, they call it Zamazama, -zama, and it's a big issue in South Africa. You talk to the Minister for Mines in South Africa, you admit that illegal small-scale mining is such a big issue for them. So, yes, I agree with the uh, Honorable Member's uh, assessment of the fact that you will have uh, people in your own party and in, uh, chiefs and so on and so forth trying to frustrate the situation. But I want to give a firm assurance that I'm very clear in my mind that if I get the approval from this House, I am moving in there, and I'm not just talking, I'm moving in there to, in all humility and modesty, apply the law without fear or favor. That if I don't do that, I will set myself for failure. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the second question has to do with my people, and possibly the whole Ghana. There have been serious agitations among the people of the Greater Accra region. That, unfortunately, being the capital of the country, government has encumbered a lot of their lands for the public good. Over the period, these projects elapse, or government do not have use of these lands again. But instead of the lands reverting to the Aluria owners, government officials, public officials, end up appropriating these lands and selling them to people, sometimes even foreigners, without recourse to the Aluria owners of those lands. What are you going to do to ensure that the policy that was embarked upon by the late President Mills, continued under President Mama, would be continued? That those lands which were taken for the public good and government have no use for them again are reverted to the Aluria owners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, uh, it's a major issue in our country. In fact, I should say that since my nomination and my announcement, and even before appearing before this voting committee, I've also received a lot of delegations from my chiefs, <laughs> my, my chiefs from the Savannah region, talking about this land and that land and the fact that land should be reverted to them and so on and so forth. So it's a major issue. But Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, I think this is a very important public issue, which I'll seek your permission to try and explain a little bit so that um, the issue should be set straight. Mr. Chairman, the matters, the, the category of lands, which are normally the subject matter of reversion, I will classify them under five, five different categories of lands. We're talking about lands which were compulsorily acquired before the, the, before the promulgation of the 1992 Constitution. Two, we're talking about lands which were compulsorily acquired but for which compensation was paid. We're talking about leaseholds which the government is the lessee. The government acquired land from uh, families or clans or schemes. Good. Number three. Third, we are talking about vested lands. And fourthly, we are talking about lands, fitly, sorry,
We're talking about lands which were compulsory acquired, but for which compensation was paid, but were acquired for stated purposes, which stated purposes are no longer the purposes for which the lands are being deployed. Mr. Chairman, when it comes to vested lands, I've already indicated that at 1036 seems to have resolved that, which is that if I get the approval of this house, six months from 23rd December 2020, that is 23rd June 2021, I should be expecting a recommendation from the Lands Commission on specific vested lands and the various recommendations they will give for me to forward to um, head of state for action. So, so that is number one. Number two, the lands that are acquired for which compensation has been paid, for which compensation has not been paid, we need to look at paying compensation. I mean, and, and the constitution is clear that compensation must be adequate, it must be prompt, and it must be fair. And they, there is a new culture which is evolving, which is that where you cannot pay with money, you can have some arrangement with the chiefs in order for them to take some of the lands as in lieu of compensation. And then you come to leasehold. Leasehold is not a difficult one. When the lease expires, the lessor or the grantor will determine whether to extend the lease or to have his, his or her land back. The, the real, and, and of course, when it comes to lands compulsively acquired before the 1992 constitution, in the case of Okujito Ablakwa versus the Attorney General, it, it was clear, it was determined that that provision of Article, Article 20 does not apply to lands which were acquired before, compulsively acquired before the 1992. The tiny one, the real difficult one, the big elephant in the room, has to do with the lands which have been acquired, compensation is paid, but the lands have not been used for the stated purposes for which the lands were acquired. Mr. Chairman, on that score, I will respectfully crave your indulgence to allow me to also point out some of the decisions of the Supreme Court of our country. I first will refer to the case of Obitete through the Ted and Attorney General, 2010 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 9904, where the Supreme Court held, Mr. Chairman, quote, once the use to which the land is not to be put is not restricted to any personal or individual interest, but one to which the general public will have a benefit or the benefits of the project will inure to the entire country, either directly or indirectly, the public interest purpose will be deemed to have been adequately catered for end quotes. So the, the import of this ruling is that even where land is acquired, compensation has been paid, the stated purpose for which the land is acquired is no longer the purpose for which the land will be used. If it will be used for a purpose which will inure to the benefit of the people, the requirement of stated purpose, stated public purpose, is satisfied. Mr. Chairman, in fact, in the case of, in the case of Okujeto Ablakwa versus Attorney General in Obichebi Lamti, number two, 2012, two Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 845. The Supreme Court even went a step further. And the Supreme Court, per the respected judge, Robert J.S.C., reasoned as follows and held as follows. Quote, Mr. Chairman, the, without rudely interrupting him, the way the nominee wants to elaborately answer a question, we may, we may do 24 hours here. <laughs> on him alone. So if you can restrict the answers. No, it's not that I don't want good answers, but I understand. He wants to elaborately make reference to ruling. It's good to answer questions. But if he answers them this way, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are likely not to be able to vet more than him alone today. So if Mr. Chairman could guide him. Thank you for alerting us. I'm not member. Please be guided. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm fully, answers, guided. I'm fully guided. I'm fully guided. more follow up. Yes, I'm fully report. guided. But I'll just respectfully, uh, Leader, to, to say that the, I'm sorry, the, the issue of compulsory acquisition of lands and whether or not they should be returned to the original owner is a major issue. Even before I'm being vetted and before I'm being sworn in, hopefully, a lot of 
request from all over the country. So I, I just thought that it's important. But, but for Honourable Chairman, with your endorsement, Honourable you. Nominee, so, so, so in, so, so, it there, we've had those cases you cited, but as guided by Chairman and uh, Honourable Whip, brevity should be the way. As for the references you have done, we'll read them thoroughly ourselves. But come back to composite acquisition. Go to Article 20, just your last words, and then contextualize it within subsection 5 and 6 of Article 20, not just the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, Chairman, with your indulgence, no property or any description or interest in or right over any property shall be compulsorily taken possession of or acquired by the state unless the following conditions are satisfied. So minimum, you have some conditions you must satisfy. Now, just the words you use, read what 5 and 6 says and give us an assurance to what Honorable Nilante wants from you. Any, any property compulsorily taking possession of or acquired in the public interest or for a public purpose shall be used only in the public interest or for that public purpose. We have seen people go for these lands, then use them for other purposes other than this. So first is what will you do about that category of land? Then the sixth chairman, where the property is not used in the public interest or for the purpose for which it was acquired, the owner of the property immediately before the compulsory acquisition shall be given the first option for acquiring the property. So take for instance, Ghana lands or lands within the greater Accra region. The state acquired it in the public interest. The state is not using it for the public interest. The chiefs are saying that respect the provisions of Article 26 and let it revert back to us. Will you do that if you become minister? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, um, with the greatest of respect, if you will indulge me to just read the decision of the Supreme Court, it's just a paragraph. No, because otherwise I'll be, otherwise I'll be misconstrued. I am, I'm absolutely not against reverting compulsory acquired land to chiefs. I'm very much not against it. On the contrary, I want to promote it. But, but the point I'm making is that the Supreme Court had an occasion to interpret the provisions referred to by the Honorable Minority Leader. And the interpretation they put on them, those who were not my words respectfully, Mr. Chairman, Broby, speaking for the court, said, the first point may be made on these provisions in that this court has by majority decision of four to three decided that Article 25 and 6 do not apply to the lands acquired compulsorily before the coming into force of the 1992 constitution. It goes on and on. And it goes on to say the plaintiffs contended that the property should be retained for the purpose for which it was originally acquired. That would mean that defendant was to that would mean that would mean that will be by the minister or any public officer. The grant to the second defendant was to develop the property into three blocks of flats of at least four stories. Which of the two uses will benefit the public more or satisfy the, the public purpose as required by the constitutional provisions? In the light of the explanations of the two expressions in the true case referred above, I take the view that the use to which the Lands Commission directed the second defendant to put the land will serve public interest or will be for public purpose. So, Mr. Chairman, the Supreme Court seems to have, yeah, they've, they've given a settlement on this. But, uh, that was your third question. That was your second question. Very well. Honorable nominee, from, from your explanation, which I will say I won't hold you to it because you are not a member of the bench at that time. But <laughs> uh, let me say, don't you think this is the reason why politicians over the years have used their political positions to take over set lands for their personal use, commercial use, why should a politician 
take a land that belongs to a family, a stool, and build apartments Honorable, for his personal use. Honorable, Honorable Nilante, yes. there's, there's no evidence before this committee that Politician. I'm not hearing you, Chairman, because they are making noise. About there, there's no evidence before this committee. Please, can you shout? Chairman is speaking. There's no evidence before this committee that politicians are taking over public lands. Okay, public Another officials. Way, so public you officials. There, Chairman, there are a lot of evidence. Chairman, I can give you. I can give you evidence. Obviously. Well, no, the issue is the appropriate it's a legitimate forum issue. It's very bad. Please, it's Can a legitimate me? issue. This is a concern of my constituents. Honorable. Please, this is a concern of my constituents. Oh. Please, what are you Sorry. Neil, I'm saying that you're tagging politicians as taking over public lands. I'm not aware of any such thing. If there's anything you find wrong anywhere, you know where to go. But please don't put that, the words in, in, in the mouth of the nominee. Bring, okay. ask questions that relate to the yeah. issue. Okay. Let me say, for, let me give you an example, perfect example. The Dowenia irrigation lands, which government since the days of Achampon took for agri purposes, today hmm, is being used as estate developing and all that. For, or let me say, to the detriment of the Aludia owners of that property, what do we do to resolve such problems? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to conclude on this matter by indicating that Article 257 of the Constitution best all public lands in the president. Again, Article 258, sub clause 2, gives the president the constitutional mandate to direct the Lands Commission. So, on a case by case basis, in spite of the decisions of the Supreme Court, if the president, as a trustee for public lands, takes the position that public land, certain land which were compulsorily acquired, be reverted or be given back to the Alodia owners, there will be no constitutional or legal bar. And indeed, I do know that sometime last year, the president met with chiefs from Accra and assured them that hopefully in the second term, there will be a mechanism, a framework, within which their grievances will be heard and possibly resolved. And I, if I get a nod of this committee, I want to make a firm assurance that pursuant to the vision and, and, and goal of the president, we will do that. But I respectfully say that we have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis, where the justice demands that lands be reverted to the, to the Alodia owners. We will do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for giving me a vote. Yeah, Thank you yeah, very sir. much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Samuel Abdullah Jinnapur. Uh, congratulations. It's a, it's a gentleman in whom I'm very well pleased. <laughs> and then it's, it's a brother in whom I'm very well pleased. And I'm very satisfied with your accomplishments and your responses so far. Honorable Chairman, I'm riding on the Article 2573 that the Honorable Minority Lease regarding the vesting of uh, lands, some lands in the three northern regions previously, before the creation of Savannah and of East regions. Now, I have also done some work on some of these vested lands. Clearly, one kilometer square around the Winneba runabouts is vested land. That is on record. Kuforidua lands are vested lands. Sudani lands are vested lands. But the particular vested lands in the three northern regions are not known. So there's a confusion whether they are compulsorily acquired or they are vested land. And I take very uh, good inspiration from the provision that you mentioned in the New Lands Act. 
that all vested lands would, would more or less be consolidated and a register would be made. I will want you to give assurance to this committee and the people of the three northern regions in particular that this exercise will be carried out with alacrity and dispatch. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, member, the northern regions are more than three. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, first of all, I, I will not pretend to have all the answers here. If I get the uh, approval of this house, I want to assure my good friend, the uh, MP for Bushegu, that it's a matter that I will, I will, I will, I will look at very seriously. Thank you. Very well. Um, okay, I got that. I'm going back. Honorable Nobini, congratulations. My first major concern has to do with the felling of the share tree in the northern ecological zone. This tree is an economic tree, but in recent times, that tree has been felled, time without number, for charcoal burning, plus the destruction that is being caused to the rosewood tree species, which is um, categorized as an endangered tree species. Honorable Nobini, if you're giving the nod, what would you do to protect the shared tree and our precious rose wood, which is endangered? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may begin with rosewood. Ghana is a party, uh, a state party, to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And the convention is such that there are three categorizations of species. They categorize them in Appendix 1, Appendix 2, and Appendix 3. If a species is placed in Appendix 1, it means that that species cannot be harvested, traded in, or exported at all. If a species is placed in Appendix 2, it means that the species can be traded in, but in a regulated framework. And if a species is placed in Appendix 3, it means the species cannot be, the species can be harvested, traded, and exported freely. Rosewood is placed in Appendix 2, which means the government of Ghana can allow the harvesting, trading, and exportation of rosewood in a regulated fashion. The government of the day felt that the rate at which rosewood was being harvested was not sustainable, and therefore the government put a temporary ban on the harvesting, trading in, and exportation of this species. So this is where we are. There's a ban. There's, there's a ban on the harvesting and, and, and trading in and exportation of this species. Now, Mr. Chairman, what do we do? I will, if I get the nod, I certainly will be advised by the Forestry Commission properly, and out of which we can, uh, we can fashion out a policy to be able to deal with this situation. But there are two or three matters we cannot escape, Mr. Chairman. One is that we need to deal with the enforcement regime. Because even while the ban is in place, we are all very much aware that there is some illicit um, uh, harvesting and trading and, and exportation of rose fruit today, even though there's a ban. So the whole enforcement regime has to be looked at and looked at carefully. Two, I think the Forestry Commission almost immediately will have to conduct an audit, an audit which will establish the stocks of this species in the forest. How many species do we have? How many rosewood do we have in the forest? I think that will help. And number two, number three, I also think that if there's, going to, if there's ever going to be the lifting of the ban, we must have a relationship between plantation and harvesting. We cannot 
just go on with harvesting. We need to have a plantation scheme which will uh, assure us that the harvesting, trading, and exportation of rose food is, will be sustainable. And finally, I, I will say that uh, we need to also have a regime for value addition because the experts tell me that the more you add value to the wood, the less the harvesting will be because if you don't add value, it means that they just fell the trees and they export them. So, Mr. Chairman, on rosewood, this is what I, I think we can do. The issue of share tree, I'm aware that the Green Climate Fund in collaboration with the Forestry Commission and the Global Share Alliance and UNDP have a grant which they are going to um, spend for purposes of promoting the plantation of share and the, and the, and the protection of share. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nomini. Um, you have already touched on illegal mining, but um, I want to be very specific. And uh, this particular question is uh, one that relates to happenings in your own backyard. And I'm talking about uh, dollar power. There's a lot of illegal mining going on uh, there. And in fact, the mining activities are concentrated in a forest reserve, which is meant to give some uh, protective cover to the Bui Hydro um, Power Plant in that area. If you are giving the nod, what would you do to ensure that illegal mining in the forest reserve around the dollar power area is stopped. And this is very important because it has even resulted in a boundary dispute between Ghana and La Côte d'Ivoire, which recently resulted in the capture of a Ghanaian citizen who is languishing in, in an Ivorian prison. So what would you do? Mr. Chairman, very um, important steps we have to take. This town, the Honorable Member has mentioned, essentially the briefing I have is that it's an enclave between the, the, the borders of Ghana and La Côte d'Ivoire. And the town is essentially ungovernable. There's no government control, number one. There are absolutely no access at all to this town. So it's almost like a jungle, if you want. And fortunately or unfortunately, the area seems to have large depths of gold. And so Ivorians come in, Ghanaians from the Savannah region and the northern region and other parts of the country troop in there on motorbikes to engage in illegal small-scale mining. I think the first thing we have to do, and I know the Ministry of national security is very much on top of this. The first thing we have to do is to ensure that the government of Ghana has some grip on that area. Um, there are issues of uh, where our, our, our boundaries begin and where they end and so on and so forth. The Boundaries Commission is very active in that. And so my view would be that the governmental control, the state control of that area would be most important. Number two, I think we need to find a way of um, ensuring access roads, access roads to this particular enclave. And thirdly, if we can fashion out some form of community mining in that area, which will rope in the people who are engaged in illegal mining, so that we can sanitize that environment and make sure that it doesn't become a situation that it is. As it stands now, it even has national security implications, I would think. Yes, um, that leads me to my next question, and you have already um, briefly talked about the Ghana Boundary Commission as one body which needs to be proactive to resolve the problems we have um, around the dollar power area. But now, what, um, in your view, what is your view with respect to, first of all, the, the, the placement 
of the Ghana Boundary Commission under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources that you would be heading uh, need given the not given the multi-sectorial functions of, of that commission. Some of the functions include delimiting our land boundaries and uh, uh, demarcating them as well as delimiting our maritime boundaries, etc. Should, should that commission be placed under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources? Mm. Mr. Chairman, the work of the, the, the Ghana Boundaries Commission will appear to be quite a complex one. Um, the Ghana Boundaries Commission's mandate essentially is to determine, negotiate, and or delineate the boundaries of Ghana as they relate to Ghana and its neighboring uh, countries. So that's the mandate of the, of, the, of the Ghana Boundaries Commission. Where does the borders of Ghana begin? Where do they end? That is essentially their work, both on land and on our seas. Now, they do so for purposes of one, determining the landmass of Ghana. So this is why it is under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. Number two, they do so also under, uh, they do so also in the sea to determine the natural resources of our country, and I have the act here, the Ghana Boundaries Commission Act, uh, Act 795, where there is a detailed uh, spell out of the objects of the commission, the functions of the commission. So I think that the placement of the, of the Ghana Boundaries Commission under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources is perfect, absolutely normal. There's nothing wrong because they are dealing with the, the lands of Ghana as well as the natural resources of Ghana in the sea. Now, Mr. Chairman, I, I recognize that um, my good friend, the Honorable Agaga, being a former Deputy uh, Minister for Interior, is fully aware, and I'm also aware, of the, the ongoing discussion about the potential conflict between the mandate of the Ghana Immigration, the, the, of, of, of the Ghana Immigration Service and the Ghana uh, Hundreds Commission. But I, I don't see any conflict at all. To my mind, I respectfully think that the Ghana Boundaries Commission's mandate is exclusively for purposes of determining what are the borders of Ghana, whereas the, the, the Ghana Immigration Service, their mandate is border security, protecting the borders of Ghana. So a situation may even arise where the Ghana Immigration Service is, 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 is unsure of where the borders of Ghana uh, begins and ends for purposes of protecting their bodies, where they will knock on uh, the yes, doors. Excuse me. Did you say the immigration services to protect the borders of Ghana? So that the, the military immigration is to deal with people who are entering and leaving Ghana. Well, well, that, that may be another way of putting it. I mean, it, I think I think it's a clearer way of putting it, which is um, the the issues of immigration, uh, people coming in and out. But they need a, a definite determination of the borders of the country in order to be able to tell whether somebody is entered into Ghana or somebody is outside Ghana. So, so this is where the relationship arises. The relationship arises between the Ghana Boundaries Commission and the Ghana Immigration Service. For the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the Ghana Boundaries Commission, it, it relates to where do we end? Where, where do we determine the borders of Ghana? The Ghana Immigration Service will then also be. But I agree with the Honorable Member. There is an ongoing reform work which will um, result in the Minister for Interior having a seat on the commission of the Ghana uh, Hundreds Commission so that he will also from the outset have input as to how um, the events are unfolded uh, there. Thank you. Last um, follow-up question. Um, given the functions of the commission, one would have expected that this particular commission, the Ghana uh, Boundary Commission, would have been um, proactive to forestall conflict between Ghana and its neighbors. So our maritime boundary largely will have to be determined by the ITLOS. What that simply tells me is that 
the commission to a large extent has not been very efficient in the discharge of its um, mandate. If given the nod, what would you do to ensure that that commission is effective and efficient in the discharge of its mandate? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the commission was first established in as far back as uh, the year 1970. It was not operationalized until the year 2010, when this dispute arose between Ghana and the Republic of uh, La, La Côte d'Ivoire, uh, which then resulted in uh, the operationalization of 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 the Ghana Boundaries Commission. There's a lot that we can do. There is, um, there is a brigadier a general who is heading it, and whom I find extremely um, up to the task. Uh, but there's a lot of work that I think they can do for the country, and the responsibilities they have are enormous. So I can give that assurance. That given the opportunity, I will keep a close eye on them. Okay, you're done. Yes, um, is it okay, Uncle Central? I do so, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Designate, let's um, move into some practical areas. I think um, members know yeah, everybody seems to be asking you legal questions, and that ministry has a lot of legal issues to be dealt with. Let's look at Act 547, that is the Timber Resources Management Act. Very well. And um, that's, it deals with the Timber Resources Management Act. That's the Timber Resources Management Act and its ensuing legislation that is regulation that is um, LI2254 on the timber resources management legality licensing regulations. Uh, this House has approved or ratified over 386 has granted 386 timber rights as at September 2020. And the law requires that those rights ought to be given some approvals by this house. So you have only 54 out of the 386 that have gone through this process of ratification through this house. And um, a study by the European, European Union suggests that they are going to stop uh, timber that goes into the European Union from our part of the world. When approved, when approved, God willing, you have over 332 of such rights outstanding. What are you going to do immediately to them to get them ratified? To ratification is for a very important um, consideration which is that the matters is raised, timber, uh, gold, land, all of the minerals and natural resources of our country are for the Ghanaian people. And Parliament must have an important role in the utilization and management of the lands and natural resources of our country. So I think we have to look at the administrative mechanism. I haven't had the opportunity to go to the ministry yet, but I can almost bet, uh, and, and I'm quite certain, that the issues will do with bureaucratic inertia and the processes leading to the presentation 
of this grant to Parliament for ratification. So the assurance I can give to the committee is that we need to examine or interrogate the processes and protocols leading to the presentation of these grants to Parliament. And I will give that assurance. Thank you. I give that assurance. Very well. Thank you. My second question is on the minerals and mining local content and local participation regulation of 2020, which we passed last year. It's very similar to the local content law, the petroleum sector. It's supposed to help create a lot of job opportunities for our locals. Do you have a copy? I do. Okay. Very well. So you are talking about the localization program, recruitment of expatriates, employment and training of Ghanaians, Procurement and look of local products, your procurement list have to be uh, put on the website and what have you. It's supposed to create job opportunity. And your sector can be a very, uh, very good sector to create a lot of job opportunities in line with our party's manifesto. I want you to give an assurance to this house that you are going to ensure the actualization of this regulation to create the necessary jobs for our people within the mining subsector. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think it's a very important question that has been asked. The previous legislation which dealt with local content, um, LI21 as heaven three, we all came to the conclusion that was in, 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 inadequate. And therefore, this new LI was promulgated, LI2431. My attitude is simple. If I get the nod, I think what we have to do is to vigorously enforce the provisions of LI2431. This LI is less than a year old. The LI2173 compared to LI2204 in the petroleum sector, we all came to the firm conclusion and Parliament has made a strong intervention by passing LI2431. So my answer is simple. I mean, if I get the recommendation of this House and I get the approval of this House, whatever it takes to enforce this LI, we have to enforce it and enforce it to the letter. Because the problem has always been, Mr. Chairman, and let's face it, the problem has been that you will have the allies, you will have the regulations, you will have the laws, but for some reason, the regulations don't get enforced. And some of the figures I have actually examined, if we are able to implement this LI even to 70%, you can imagine the cascading effect it will have for Ghanaian indigenous companies. And a lot of the resources in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the mining sector will be retained right here in Ghana. So my answer will be that we should enforce the LI and enforce it forcefully. And that leads me to the last question. I believe you have the power to go after Ghanaians who want to go and hide, hide behind expatriates to take cover under the regulation. Gaidek, the president set up Gaidek, the Ghana Integrated Aluminium Oxide Authority, he recall last year with an enabling legislation the board is in place. We want to mine our bauxite. We even use some for some butter arrangements. I know VACO now has become a subsidiary of Guidec. What is your brief on this industrialization drive of the president from VACO being a subsidiary of Guidec and the whole chain? that we seek to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the vision of the President to build here in Ghana an integrated aluminum industry is a noble one. I think for many, many years in Ghana, we have all talked about 
value addition to our minerals. We've all um, been very unhappy about the exportation of raw materials out of this country. And so the president, in his wisdom, uh, uh, found it necessary that the Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation be established, which will be responsible or have the mandate of developing the full value chain of an integrated aluminium industry here in Ghana. Mr. Chairman, I'm sure um, uh, we all are, are very much aware that you cannot industrialize your country if you don't have an aluminium integrated, uh, integrated aluminium um, development industry in your country. Neither can you do so if you don't have an integrated iron and steel industry in your country. I mean, these are the twin um, efforts, twin pillars upon which industrialization can happen, that you can build cars, you can build ships, and so on and so forth. So, so the, 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 the vision, the vision of the president, I think, is one which is highly commendable. The Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation has been established. Um, the office has been established as well. They have done a lot of work already. Um, the, uh, the issues of holding Valco as a subsidiary of the Ghana Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation is all part of the program or the strategy to enhance the asset of the Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation in order for them to participate in the international market by attracting investors into our country. Not just that, the Ghana, the Ghana Bauxite Company also, Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation has been given 20% of their shares. I think all of those are part of the strategies and the mechanisms to shore up their assets so that they can participate well in, a, in the international market. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was caught off guard, but um, let me um, welcome the nominee. Uh, first of all, with um, the issue of Galamse, um, it's come up already, but um, this was a fight that His Excellency the President um, put his presidency on the line for, said he did not mind um, losing the presidency uh, as a result of his commitment to this fight. Uh, we deployed a lot of army men, police officers, even lost some of them, um, voted so much money into this fight, destroyed machines, uh, lost some, or allegedly stole some. Um, and now Samria, you know, did, you know, his investigation revealing more things that were wrong with that whole fight. In the end, Honorable Nominee, the media got excited, um, formed a coalition to support this cause. At the end of it all, the President, after the fight, in his 2021 SONA address, seemed to have been humbled by the fight when he said, and I quote, there's one subject I believe we the people have, we the people need to have an open conversation, and that is the phenomenon of Galamse, unquote. What briefing have you received from the president who nominated you as regards this fight that seemed to have humbled him in relation to what is expected if you are approved as minister, what is expected of your role in this fight? What is going to be the approach? Yes, yeah, so what's your briefing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to, first of all, 
respectfully submit that the work and the effort of President Akufuado in his first term in relation to his policy and effort to sanitize a small scale industry in our country is perhaps one of the most audacious and ambitious. I mean, and I will say that he, he ought to be commended. I think that he's the president who came into office in 2017 and found that there was this problem, this existing problem. The, 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 the issue and the problem of illegal small-scale mining came on, the, got on the ascendancy from the 1990s and he's been with us all this while. And the president took it upon himself to try and bring some sanity and some regulation in the small-scale mining industry. Mr. Chairman, when the president said that he put his presidency on the line for the fight against Galamse or illegal small-scale mining, the president meant it, and the president indeed walked his talk. Chama, he walked his talk, and with the greatest of respect, if one wants evidence of how the president walked his talk, Mr. Chairman, we should, you should just go and take the results of the 2020 general elections. The president could have done otherwise. The president could have chosen to renege on his commitment to put his presidency on the line, and that could have changed the results as we've all seen. Any, any objective um, person, cursory exam, examiner of the results would show that it is because the president indeed and in fact put his presidency on the line. That is why, even though he believed in the policies he implemented, it didn't turn out to be popular with some people. But that's what he meant by putting his presence on the line. So he walked the talk. Mr. Chairman, having said that, I want to also say that moving forward, some efforts were made, a lot of efforts were made, and some achievements were chalked in the first term of President Akufuado in a fight against illegal small-scale mining. About 4,000 illegal small-scale um, miners were trained. The whole legal architecture regime today, which I find satisfactory, for dealing with some illegal small-scale mining, were, were, were put in place under President Akufo's first term administration. Community mining, the concept of community mining, which is appearing to be the panacea for resolving the issue of illegal small-scale mining, has actually been put together and is, and is very much in place. So, Mr. Chairman, I am not proceeding, if I get the, if I get the, uh, the favor of this committee and the approval of the House, I am never proceeding on the basis that whatever happened in the past was bad. No. I think we have to look upon it as whatever what happened in the past, those that were good, we move on with them. Those we have to review, those we have to perfect, we do so and we move forward. But having said that, Mr. Chairman, I think what the President meant in his message of the State of the Nation last year by a national conversation was that we have gotten to a point where we require a bipartisan, broad-based, multi-sectorial effort in dealing with illegal small-scale mining. We need a broad-based support for the national policy on illegal small-scale mining. And so what is the policy? The policy is that we build here in Ghana a sustainable, viable, regulated small-scale mining which has regard for the environment and do away with illegal small-scale mining which degrade the environment. And coincidentally, I've looked at the manifesto of the NDC. The 2020 manifesto of the NDC is very much in accord with this national policy. It says they, are, they, they frown upon illegal small-scale mining and they support legal small-scale mining. So I think we should come together as a people. We should all come together, Honorable, both Honorable political Norman, parties. Which one do you call illegal small-scale mining? The one with heavy excavators? What is small-scale about them? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if you look at the Minerals and Mining Act, Act 703, and I've actually done a brief on it, illegal small-scale mining simply means, one, 
you don't have a license to mine. Two, even when you have a license to mine, you are not mining according to the protocols for illegal small scale mining. Three, on the specific issue of my, uh, uh, excavators and excavating and the rest, the law as it stands today permits deep mining in respect of illegal small scale mining, subject to the subject to the commitment that when you excavate and you dig a deep, you, you dig you dig you dig a, a pit. Within 30 days after excavation, you have to fill the pit and you have to plant. You have to you, you have to agitate. So the contours of the contours of legal small scale mining permit a whole lot, but only that you do it within the confines of the law and regulations. So that is the national policy. And, and my uh, can my I, contention. Can I, can I come in? To solve a problem, sometimes you need to show that you understand the cause of the problem. Can you explain why people engage in illegal small-scale mining? Can I explain? Yeah, why people engage in illegal small-scale mining? First of all, Mr. Chairman, I wouldn't have all the answers here, but I can, I can say that, one, the the enforcement of the regulatory regime itself is a problem. And i give you an example. Uh, if, let's start with but, what is illegal small-scale mining, which you yourself said is mining without a license. And, and many other... Many other uh, let's start from that one. Mining without a license. Why can't they just get licenses for those areas to mine, small-scale mining licenses? Why can't they just get that? That is, the, that is the explanation I'm trying to give. That's the, the, exactly the answer. So, so the answer is this, Mr. Chairman, with respect. If you say that illegal mosque miners to acquire licenses before they mine, there is a community that my friend and brother, the Honorable Agalga mentioned, alluded to, Bole, and you are expecting the illegal mosque miner to travel all the way from Bole to Accra. He gets to Accra, he doesn't know where the Minerals Commission is. He finds his way to the Minerals Commission. He so one of your solutions will be that you will make sure that licenses can be acquired in the districts. We have to do that. But the actually small-scale district, uh, uh, small-scale mining offices in the various districts. The country has been zoned by the Minerals Commission into districts. And in these zones, they actually do have district, you know, small-scale mining offices that issue small-scale mining licenses. Second thing, people mine in concessions. There are minerals there. They want license. They cannot get license. And yet, there are minerals buried under the trees. How do you stop those people from going for those minerals under the trees? Secondly, at the Minerals Commission, they zone... Well, you've got just a follow-up, but you... I'm not an available leader. And I must, ben I must benefit from being an available leader. And I get to ask uncountable questions as an available leader. It's not a privilege I ordinarily enjoy. <laughs> yes. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, he is an available leader, but he doesn't come with all the privileges. All I was expecting, if it's a follow-up question, then it must relate to the answer. But then you're taking advantage to go off the answer and asking new questions. That's my question. I, 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 Chairman, there's something I want him to do. I... <laughs> You are, in, you are in a hurry to get me out of the seat. <laughs> well, the issue is that I just, I just think that to deal with the problem of illegal small-scale mining, we just look at the causes of illegal small-scale mining and have a roadmap in terms of it is one, two, three, four, five reasons. And that becomes your story. Because Swain is asking you, what would you do differently to address the issue of illegal small-scale mining, which we call Galamse? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Chairman, very straight away, I think we need to pursue this concept of community mining. I think it's very important. I've looked at the literature, I've taken a lot of briefings, I've examined the situation, and I'm more than fully persuaded that the perfection and ramping up of community mining in our country will go a long way in dealing with the incidences of illegal mosque mining. You are very right, uh, Honorable Ayarga, you are extremely right that reforms in the Minerals Commission itself is completely um, important. I mean, it's the same qua known. We need to reform we need to reform the Minerals Commission in terms of its operations. I don't by any means suggest that the Minerals Commission has not done any good job. They've done their best in the circumstances, but I think the next phase, the next phase of our efforts should be about how we are going to reform the operations and services of the Minerals Commission so that their services will be readily available and also for us to promote community mining. And finally, finally, Mr. Chairman, it's also that we need that broad-based support. We need the support of the chiefs. We need the support of the local authorities. I would think we need the support of the miners. And if I get the approval of this house, I intend to visit mining communities myself as minister, leading the Ministry of Lands and Resources, to engage all the actors and stakeholders and so that we can, we can, we can construct broad-based coalition and support around this national policy of a viable, sustainable, lawful, regulated small-scale mining in Ghana. That is another, another small point. At the Minerals Commission, when those, you talk about community mining, and that's what you will do. When the communities go to the Minerals Commission, they find out that the entire community has already been plotted and concession out to some investor who never shows up. But on paper, that area is encumbered. What do you expect the community to do? In, in those kinds of situations, um, Mr. Chairman, it will mean that, by the grace of God, if I get the opportunity, I have to show leadership. We, we cannot allow that to happen. We don't have to permit that. In fact, there's even been the talk about the state itself taking up exploration for purposes of granting concessions for small-scale mining. Yes, you are right. And, 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 and that I don't make any pretense about. We need to shake a few things. And God will and I intend to do that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just would like to note that that was my first question. Uh, so that, yeah, that uh, acknowledge that. It doesn't look like my session has dragged because I have been asking questions. Um, but a quick follow-up to the answer given to uh, my question. Honorable nominee, don't you think that the President's um, humbling request for us to uh, have a conversation about this phenomenon after four years of the commitment that you speak of and the decision to disband the interministerial committees and admission of failure with the plan that was initially used? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, first of all, um, I'm, I'm unable to understand or appreciate the adjective humbling. I'm not too sure about what that means. Um, I, I've said that already, and I will repeat it, that the call by the President was apt, was appropriate, and I believe that it was on the back of the needless politicization of illegal small-scale mining in our country, where, in many cases, when a particular political party in government makes attempts to resolve, sanitize the small-scale mining industry, the opponent of the government, depending on who is in opposition, will very quickly find uh, a way of uh, scoring political points out of it. I believe it is in that spirit that the president felt that it's about time for us to depoliticize this sector of small-scale mining. Or we should face it, Mr. Chairman. It's indeed a national problem. 
All right. When you go to mining communities, there are people who are suffering from health hazards. Some of them are getting brutally ulcers as a result of mercury, the use of mercury in mining. Mr. Chama, you go to um, mining communities and environments are degraded, climate change is becoming a problem, and so on and so forth. And that is the spirit in which the president asked that we should have a national conversation around it so that we can have, as I said, that broad-based support for the fight against illegal mining in our country. By all measure, I want to repeat and I want to insist that in all humility and modesty, the effort of President Akufuado in his first term in dealing with illegal small scale mining is unprecedented. I'm not too sure in the Fourth Republic there's ever been any government which has taken on this fight in a manner that he did. He ought to be, he ought to be commended and I think that it was a courageous, bold step that he took. I don't find anything um, as a failure about it. There were, there were a lot of successes struck. There were challenges in respect of illegal small scale mining in our country. And finally, the dissolution of the Inter Interministerial Committee um, on Illegal Mining really has nothing to do with failure or... On, on yeah, it, 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 has nothing, it has nothing to do with failure. The government sets up committee for purposes of its first term. In the second term, they believe that they, they, they will use other means in, 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 in resolving those issues. All right, that's I, fine. I think the Mr. President Chairman, um, let's... Let me invite the nominee to the issue of uh, land. Land ownership and uh, security of title seem to be um, one of the uh, concerns that many people have with our land management system. In 2008, through LAP, we were able to at least consolidate uh, four institutions into the uh, uh, land commission the National Land Commission. Um, but I think the Seventh Parliament also successfully passed uh, the land law that sought to consolidate a number of different acts governing land management in this country. But the issues that still remain are turnaround time for processing land customer feedback and corruption and bribery at some of the institutions responsible for you know facilitating and assuring uh, security of title and supporting land ownership what will you do as minister to improve the turnaround time for processing land uh, ensure that the institutions uh, customer feedback you know is improved and check bribery and corruption that militate against the efficiency of these institutions thank you mr chairman mr chairman the honorable member is very right a lot of people have so many difficulties in uh, land administration in Ghana. I know that successive administrations have done their bit. Uh, we still have a situation which is quite unacceptable. And the president's vision for land administration in Ghana is to arrive at a situation where land becomes a catalyst or a, a contributor to national development and economic growth as opposed to an inhibition. And so whatever we have to do to perfect land administration in Ghana will be extremely important. I know people who, who have bought land and they paid good money and they are unable to plot those lands, uh, multiple sales, fraud in the land system, um, and many other, 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 other difficulties. Mr. Chairman, uh, in the first term administration of the, uh, President Akufuado, I know that lap one, lap two, which is the land administration scheme, one and two, which was done in conjunction with the World Bank, did resolve some of the issues. At this stage, I think what we have to do is to roll out a program which will digitize the records of the Lands Commission. For me, I think that is absolutely non-negotiable. 
And I do know that the Lands Commission itself has piloted the digitization of the records of, of the administration of lands in Ghana. We need to, we need to move on with that, and, and we need to do that forcefully. Um, we are told that we need to involve private sector participation. So the issues of value for money, we have to look at all of that. And ultimately, we get to the situation where land administration and, and all the records of the Lands Commission are digitized, and so that people can assess um, the services of the Lands Commission with ease. And finally, I think in many cases, the front end of the Lands Commission tends to be perfect. I mean, you go to the Lands Commission, and you are in an air-conditioned room, they serve you water, uh, they receive you well, you put in your application, and when it goes to the back end, it becomes business as usual. So we need to tackle both the front end and the, and the, and the, and the back end. But I can assure this committee that if I get the approval, it is a matter that I'll look at carefully. Thank you. Now, honorable nominee, finally, Aram Sayasides. Aram Sayasides. The one that comes to mind quick, immediately is the Sakumono uh, area where real estate companies are encroaching uh, upon those areas. Our forest cover is at risk across the country. Rosewood is being exploited crudely. Our shear trees are under threat. And all these contribute especially to rural poverty. What is your understanding of the problem with these, you know, uh, 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 with these things in the forest sector? Maybe Ramsayer site aside. I know it's a, a multi-dimensional uh, 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 question, but I, I believe that you can deal with it. What is your approach? What is going to be your approach to dealing with these concerns? Ramsayer sites, our forest cover that are being crudely exploited. Uh, especially rosewood and our sheer uh, uh, trees that contribute to rural poverty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think the question relating to rosewood and sheer, if I recall, I think I've given an answer. So I will rely on my, 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 my first answer. Mr. Chairman, on the issue of forest cover and afforestation, that obviously, the Honorable Member is right. That is a major issue. And that is going to be a big assignment that if I get approval of this House, I will have to uh, make sure that we deal with it. Mr. Chairman, I know that in the past administration, a lot of work was done. Um, for instance, under the Ghana Forest Plantation uh, Scheme, 2016-2040, the the government of Ghana planted 101.9 million trees, um, about 70 hectares of um, uh, area was planted, about 16,180 hectares was, was done, a, wh a whole lot was done under the first term. But I believe that we've gotten to the point where if this committee were to recommend me and I'm approved by the House, I think we need to roll out an aggressive afforestation scheme an afforestation scheme which will not look at tinkling, which will not look at small, small interventions, but which will ensure that we aggressively um, roll out a program of afforestation. Mr. Chairman, it has been reported that Ethiopia, for instance, in a day, Ethiopia is supposed to have, um, um, Ethiopia is supposed to have planted 350 million trees led by the president of Ethiopia, and 19 million Ethiopians were involved. I think in our country, Ghana, I'm looking forward to having the opportunity, and if I got the opportunity, the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources should be able to come up with a program where once in a year, and preferably on June 5th, which is the World Environment Day, the President of our Republic will lead a tree, a tree a planting exercise. The President will plant a tree. Uh, hopefully, His Majesty, as Antigno II, will plant a tree. Uh, hopefully, His Majesty, the Yana, will plant a tree. And, 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 and Mr. Chama himself will, will also do plant a tree here in Parliament. And about, say, 5 million Ghanaians will plant trees. But not just the planting of the trees, Mr. Mr. Chama. The planting of the trees is one thing. But seeing to the growth of the trees to maturity is another. And so the program must contemplate the situation where we are going to ensure that we plant and we see to the growth of the trees. And finally, I should say that we should not just plant trees. We should plant economic trees. 
So we are here discussing shear nuts. We are, we are here discussing shear trees, rosewood, and the rest. So the trees we are planting should be economic trees, um, shear trees, timber, wawa, and, and so on and so forth. And therefore, it becomes an investment. So my thinking about the afforestation program of this country. Okay, it's two o'clock. Um, two hours. Suspend so setting for ten minutes. It is a nightmare dealing with the filth in Accra. The gutters are choked with garbage. The streets are a jumble of filth. The beauty of the serene beaches is marred with human feces and plastics as many defecate in the open. Residents are up in arms when the situation gets out of hand. Because of these meetings, you can't even see, stand there for even a minute as we speak here. Speak here. Even mosquitoes even refuse to breathe on it. Partners in sanitation suggest alternative policy interventions. Landfilling is not the way forward. We are recommending treatment facilities. But in all of this, have we made gains in the sector? How can you have a people who have a lot of dignity and still practicing the individual? The task facing Ghana to achieve SDG Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation for all is Herculean and riddled with equally complicated hurdles. Join us every Thursday on Wash Hour from 4.05 p.m. to 5 p.m. as we seek to put these issues and more in perspective. Watch a repeat on Fridays from 1 to 2 p.m. and on Sundays 9.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. It is our duty to keep our surroundings clean and free from disease. There are strong women whose stories teach us perseverance, logic, decisiveness and self-confidence. Being strong is not just about physical abilities but also emotional, intellectual and mental strength. Women's Voice is a platform to hear and share stories to encourage women and girls. Women are the real architects of society. It is they who provide the foundation of power, grace, wisdom, justice, creativity and hope. Join us live every Monday at 4 p.m. on GBC News and GTV. Wednesdays live at 4 p.m. on GBC News and a repeat on Saturdays at 4 p.m. on GBC News and Sundays at 3 p.m. also on GBC News. Women's Voice. No Tehran, capital of Iran, has a population of 8.7 million in the city and 15 million in the larger metropolitan area of Greater Tehran. The city is the most populous in Iran and Western Asia. Tehran, 
is the third largest metropolitan area in the Middle East, after Cairo and Istanbul. Overall, it is ranked 24th in the world by the population of its metropolitan area. Tehran has a temperate climate as it is located at 35.41 north latitude and 51.15 east longitude and 1,200 meters above sea level, which makes it a little cooler than other capitals in the Middle East. Tukal is a mountain and ski resort located on the Albals mountain range, adjacent to the metropolitan area of Tehran in northern Iran. It includes a 12-kilometer long ridge. Tehran covers an area of 1,500 square kilometers in the north-central part of Iran on the slope of the Albals mountain. Tehran became the capital of Iran in 1795 when Aga Mohammed Khan became king. In Persian, the word Iran means land of the Aryans. In December 2018, Satellite images revealed that Tehran, the capital of Iran, is sinking into the earth at a rate of 10 inches per year. Geoscientists Magdi Moktag and Mahmoud Hagigi from the GFS German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam used satellite data to monitor subsidence across the Tehran region between 2003 and 2017. Famous biblical figures purported to be buried in Iran include Esther, Daniel, Cyrus the Great, Darius the Great, and Saint Thaddeus. The three wise men who followed the star to Israel to pay homage to the newborn king, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, are thought to have come from Persia, whose modern name is Iran. According to data from the mid-1990s, all Protestant churches in Iran claimed an ethnic and Iranian membership of up to 15,000. A 2015 study estimated that there were 100,000 Christian believers from a Muslim background living in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran is an Islamic state where close to 98% of the population are Muslims. The nation's constitution is largely based on Islamic law. The dominant religious group in Iran is Shia Muslims. Sunni Muslims are the second largest religious group. The Kurds and Turkmen are predominantly Sunni Muslims, but Iran's Arabs are both Sunni and Shiite. Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians are small communities. The starting point for the base in Iran it's not secular law and civil rights, but the tradition of Muslim jurisprudence and practice called Sharia. The ideas of nationalism, secularism, religion, and revolution are unique in this Muslim country. The economy of Iran is mixed and transition economy with a large public sector. It is the world's 18th largest by purchasing power parity. Some 60% of Iran's economy is centrally planned. Iran is dominated by oil and gas production, although over 40 industries are directly involved in the Tehran Stock Exchange, one of the best in the world. Iran commands 10% of the world's oil reserves and due to its development potential, made a member of a group called Nest 11 countries likely to break out into a juggernaut. With its enormous natural resources and a young, educated population, Iran has the potential to become an economic power. The Iranian government directly owns and operates hundreds of state-owned enterprises and indirectly controls many companies affiliated to state-run structures. Iran's infrastructure is not high standard and relatively inadequate. Part of this stems from the fact that the vast country was never fully developed 